Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final OMSCS Digital Career Seminar of the semester. I'm Brittany Aiello, and I manage communications for the OMSCS program. We are about to get started, and so we're just watching a few people roll on in here last minute. Um, but before we bring our, our guest speaker, Michael, up, I can share a little bit about the seminar series and about Shindig, our awesome hosts. So the idea for this seminar comes from the belief that online students at Georgia Tech can and should have accessible, affordable, top-tier educational experiences. So we see career resources like this seminar as a new additional way that we can help students and even prospective OMSCS students in our community potentially succeed uh, and achieve their aspirations, the reasons that they want to be in the program or are in the program. So speaking of our program and graduates, um, tonight we have a former OMSCS student and a U.S. Army veteran, Michael Brown, here to chat with us. But before we get going, with that, uh, a lot of you aren't familiar with Shindig, this awesome platform that we're using. And so we're going to queue up a video that's just super short to familiarize uh, you with all the features that you can use during the chat. So Tara is going to queue that up in just a second. Welcome to Shindig, the video chat event provider. Click on any participant's image to engage in a private video chat. Double click on another participant to add them to your existing conversation. Click the arrow to exit. You can also send an instant message, either to an individual or to your entire room. Want to interact with the host? Use the buttons on the lower right. Click raise hand to signal to the event administrator that you want to be brought on stage. Otherwise, submit a question to the host via text. If the system has not automatically detected your webcam and microphone, roll over your image and click Settings. Click your image to enable your working webcam. Choose a working microphone by selecting the option with volume indicators that flash green in response to your voice. We hope this was helpful. Enjoy the event. All right, so as the video said, this is a very interactive platform and we want this seminar to be interactive. So as we go along, if you have questions for Michael or for me, um, or would like to share your thoughts on something, we want you to, and you have a couple of options to do that. You can raise your hand and we will queue you up or ask your question for you if you wanna post it in the text chat. Um, some bold, brave folks like to come up on stage with us and we love that and we welcome it. Um, so, I'd like to share a little bit about our, our uh, guest this evening. Michael Brown is, uh, like I said, a former OMSCS student and U.S. Army veteran. He and I first spoke several years back. I was producing a feature story about some of the first active duty servicemen and women to enroll in the OMSCS program. We recently reconnected at an Atlanta OMSCS event, and he was able to share the impact that the program had had on his life. Um, and it was fascinating and I loved hearing his story. So I thought he's perfect. He would be a great seminar guest. I'm sure a lot of students have questions that he could answer about their experience and what they can look forward to or anticipate in the program. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and bring Michael up on the stage. Hey, Michael. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Um, it's my pleasure. To get going, I think it would be great if you could share a little bit about your background and your work and educational experience, um, just a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I'm originally from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. I was uh, born and raised there and went and uh, got my undergraduate degree from the University of Cincinnati in computer science. And then uh, shortly after I joined the, uh, joined the Army. I was in the Army uh, for eight years, uh, started up in about uh, 2009 and was on active duty until very recently, uh, in fact, uh, just this summer. And uh, during my last two years of, uh, of time in on, on active duty, uh, I discovered the OMS program, enrolled in it, and uh, completed the program, and uh, it took me about two years. And then uh, right around the time I graduated uh, was around the time I was starting the process to uh, exit the military, re-enter the civilian workforce, 
and uh, recently have uh, moved to Atlanta. I uh, now work for uh, the Georgia Tech Research Institute as a research scientist. And I get to do some really interesting research projects in the field of cybersecurity, software analysis, and a little bit of network security as well. Um, some of you may also know me. I do a little bit of work on the side for the OMS program. I was a, uh, I was a teaching assistant for a long time, and uh, I recently uh, was asked to co-instruct uh, 6340, which is uh, software analysis and testing for anybody who's taken, uh, taken that class here this semester. Uh, and then I'll also be teaching it next semester as well. Awesome. So you have basically experienced every part of the OMSCS program, student, TA, now you're helping teach a class, which is really exciting and awesome. Um, yeah. So let's talk about uh, your decision to enroll in the program or to apply to the program. What prompted that? Um, what sort of career aspirations did you have uh, at that time? Well, uh, I was... Uh... I was recently redeployed from Afghanistan uh, in 2013, uh, or actually 2014, and I was starting to think about my future when I got back home and uh, started thinking that, uh, that while I had enjoyed my time in the military, um, things were starting to wind down, at least at that time. And I was starting to uh, look at uh, you know, getting married and starting a family and, and decided that the best place for me to pursue uh, really what I wanted to get out of the, uh, you know, the next 20 or 30 years out of my life was, was not in the same place as the military. So I started looking at ways to re-enter the uh, computing industry. The, the work I did in the military was, was aviation related. So I didn't spend any time writing code or doing any uh, kind of traditional activities you would normally do with a computer science degree. So the situation I was facing was, was essentially an eight-year gap in my resume. And uh, that can really be killer for um, the tech industry for for anyone, much less much less veterans who don't have work experience that's typically in line with with the kind of work that that um, you know you'll typically see in the civilian workforce. So um, it was because of those various reasons that I started looking at uh, ways to continue my education while I was continuing to finish my uh, my active duty commitment. So I was you know taking a look at my my situation. I had about two years before I was able to um, able to terminate my uh, my service and then. In that time, I, I had some extra time. I, I wasn't uh, scheduled to go to Afghanistan again or, or go to Iraq. So uh, I was looking at something that I could do online and I could do remotely uh, because I was looking at having to move. Uh, I, I, at that time, was stationed in uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, and was on my way to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So enrolling in a, uh, in a traditional program at a brick and mortar institution really wasn't a, uh, really wasn't a possibility. I was going to have to wait eight months, uh, which is you know, a huge delay when you're trying to continue your education, or I was going to, um, or I was going to have to try and apply to two different institutions and try and transfer credits, and that's, and you know that that's a lot of a challenge in and of itself. So, you know, I was looking at different uh, different programs, and uh, and really I was looking for something that was cost effective, something that was uh, remote, and something that carried a decent reputation, and uh, was not uh, was not going to be uh, an institution that's more concerned with with uh, you know with getting your money and giving you a worthless piece of paper in return. So, um, in the, in my search, really the only thing I found that met all of my criteria was was the Georgia Tech OMSCS program, which I believe was only in its third semester at the time I discovered it. So, as soon as I found that, I, I was uh, I was immediately intrigued and applied right away. And um, really, the uh, the goal would be to get my master's degree in computer science, put some recency on my resume to help facilitate that transition out of the Army. Um, so, so, you completed your degree while you were serving. Um, and, and actually, I know you, you wanted to do this before, uh, and I neglected to, but uh, maybe we should ask the audience, if you are currently serving, it would be awesome if you could use the little hand icon and raise your hand uh, so that we can know. Um, and and if you are a veteran, if you wanna if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, um, that would also be awesome. Um, just so that we can know, and if if we want to connect, uh, if you would like to reach out to us after, we can we can know how to how to connect with you. Um, it looks like we have four who are serving actively. Um, and that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, doing school, Georgia Tech graduate student while serving. <laughs> Sounds like a lot. 
Can you talk about that experience, the balance or the struggle of juggling everything and what that was like for you? Sure. Uh, struggle is a very descriptive and very apt word for what it was. Um, it was difficult. Uh, I was I was in a uh, I was in a job in the military that required a lot of travel. Um, in aviation, we were constantly flying all over the place. Uh, sometimes we we'd be in a different location for a week or for a month. Sometimes we'd be living out of tents. Sometimes, uh, you know, we'd be uh, in an area where we'd essentially have to set up an office in an old hangar. Um, so the, the operational requirements of my job made it uh, made it very difficult to. Um, to, to kind of take on this graduate work and, and, and have access to, you know, uh, what I would consider a, a regular schedule that, that really supports uh, higher education. Um, but I was able to work it out. Um, fortunately, I was lucky in that I knew over the next uh, two years that I was going to be working on the program that uh, the unit I was leaving and the unit I was going to weren't scheduled to, to do an overseas deployment. Uh, so that was absolutely um, a key factor in me being able to uh, me being able to overcome some of those issues, and then and the fact that the program is entirely remote and uh, really doesn't require um, a lot of uh, I guess I would say uh, high bandwidth interaction. So you can download videos in advance. You can interact over over forums that are text based in this program. So uh, if you have to be in a place where you have limited access and limited connectivity, it is possible. Um, and that, that was actually, you know, quite a benefit. So, um, as I'd mentioned before, I was, uh, I was engaged and, and got married while I was in my second semester in the program. So that was another struggle, um, going from having an already demanding work, uh, work schedule to also using up my uh, time on nights and weekends to, to work on schoolwork. And then, you know, eventually I ended up becoming a teaching assistant and, uh, there's even more time I spent on it, so so frankly, I, I have to give uh, I have to give most of the uh, most of the thanks and most of the and most of the appreciation to my wife. She was incredibly supportive uh, throughout that time, uh, and uh, she kind of understand where we were going from. We had a long talk about you know getting uh, getting out of the military and what that meant for the both of us and what kind of opportunities would be available for me. So she was incredibly supportive while I while I spent two years going to class and on, on nights and weekends and then, you know, spending months away at home or months away from home. Uh, so it was, it was definitely a challenge. It was definitely a struggle, but it was, it was absolutely worth it. I got a tremendous amount out of it. I still get a lot out of uh, my interactions with the OMS program. I have people that I, you know, met online that I've never met in person who, who I know better than some of the people I work with at my new job. And, and it's kind of interesting to have this whole circle of people that you've met who are, are wonderful and great people, um, but they exist entirely in this digital space. Yeah, and that's something that we've heard, you know, in, in seminars before this. Uh, everyone has talked about the importance of both uh, your pre-existing family and community support because it's so demanding of your time, um, but also this the importance of the support of the community that you build while you're in the program, um, because especially in your case, I'm, I'm guessing that there weren't very many uh, folks, you know, that you were working with in your day to day that were also doing the same thing as you, that were also earning their master's in computer science. And so having that community um, and building it within the program had to have been a huge help. Did you find any tips or tricks, anything else that really helped you kind of get through it and uh, survive those, you know, long work hours and then long study hours and, and trying to balance everything. Absolutely. Um, so the, the biggest thing that will, um, I, I'd say the biggest, uh, I'm trying to find a good way to put this. I'd say the, the most important, uh, quality, uh, to develop before you start this program is time management. Uh, it was absolutely a, a critical skill of mine that, that led me to led me to success in, in, in the OMS program. And honestly, had I not uh, really managed my time to very small increments to, uh, you know, be productive at work, uh, you know, be successful at work, and then also be successful in, in class, and then also not sacrifice too much time from my, uh, you know, from my family. Uh, it was absolutely critical, and, and honestly, that, that that's a skill that it will help anyone in OMS. It's really uh, irrespective of uh, of military service or, or anything. Just about everybody in OMS has a has a job. They have a family. Uh, that's just kind of the profile of student we attract in this program. So, um, if if you're if you're absolutely um, looking at the number one thing you can do to prepare 
it's get very good at time management and start really assessing uh, you know, kind of the things you spend your time on and how to be productive when you can. Um, secondary to that, um, there was uh, a lot of things that I did uh, in OMS that really kind of uh, really kind of made made things a little bit smoother. Uh, I definitely leveraged the community, uh, getting to know people who had taken classes ahead of me to understand what kind of time commitments I was facing. Uh, it gets back to time management, but it also gets to you know kind of assessing with with, with your individual background what kind of classes are going to be challenging and what kind of classes uh, you might have a little bit of material that you are already familiar with and making effective pairings of classes if you're going to try and take more than one uh, per semester. Uh, I took I took two in my first semester and then I, I swore it off and then I ended up taking two every semester after that. So you can you can see a lot of good of a lot of good that plan did for me. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely say I would definitely say get your time management in order, get your family on board and um, and then also get very good at at uh, at identifying, you know, the, the people in the community that can help you. So would you say that if someone who is serving is interested in the program and they feel confident that they have that skill set or have the ability to develop the skill set that you just talked about, that it is reasonable for them to manage the, the program on average? Oh, it's more than reasonable. Um, you know, military schedules and military lifestyles are demanding. They require a lot of time that, that's absent. But, but really, the program uh, more than halfway meets students by by how remote and uh, and by how and by how well each individual course is managed. Um, in my experience, my my instructors and my teaching assistants for the classes I took were very responsive when. Uh, you know, when I had issues with my military schedule, um, I personally, as a teaching assistant and instructor, have been uh, have been very very sensitive to to the people who are, are act on active duty and and those who uh, you know might be on you know reserve or national guard duty who unexpectedly get activated, you know, in the event of a natural disaster. We've had that happen quite a few times, especially during hurricane season uh, just this year. So, um, if you're if you're on active duty or if you're on reserve duty and you're concerned about you know being activated. Or having to, um, you know, go on a field exercise or go on a deployment, the program is really built for uh, helping those people uh, or helping those service members uh, overcome some of those challenges. Whether it's taking a semester off of school, you don't have to reapply uh, if you take a semester off. Um, if you need to withdraw from a course uh, due to, a, you know, military deployment, the the school has an apparatus for doing, um, you know, compassionate withdrawals. It's not the it's not the uh, it's not the rule. It's an exception, but that exception is routinely made for for people who have documented military uh, documented military requirements. So um, the school is the school is absolutely dedicated to its service members, and, and they'll make you successful. So because the school reaches out in that way, and because of the format of the program, it's absolutely reasonable for for service members to do it. It's more a matter of of finding the time on your own than it is uh, getting the support you need to to do that. Sure. And, and I guess another arm of that is uh, the cost and the financial side of things. Um, could you share a little bit about different options, approaches um, financially that would potentially help with the program or, um, you know, things to consider? I know there's financial aid available um, to men and women, women who are serving. Um, could you talk a little bit about those sorts of options and, and your process with that? Sure. Uh, actually, um, you know, when it came to evaluating options for an online master's degree, uh, there was really only one option that's even remotely uh, cost effective, and that, and that was Georgia Tech's offering. Uh, I believe uh, Stanford has an online master's of science degree, but they charge you out-of-state tuition. So you're looking at $65,000 a year to attend a school online to, to get your master's degree, and that's cost prohibitive for just about everybody in this country. Um, especially our students abroad. Um, so it was really a, a, a lack of good options. And uh, to find a, a highly reputable school um, that has really kind of broken the mold when it comes to evaluating online education, understanding that, that the residential fees and the residential costs of, of, of higher education really don't apply to online students. And, and to make that adjustment was was absolutely revolutionary. And, and really, it's, it's a one-of-a-kind program. Uh, when it comes to uh, your options in the military, um, you know, You've got a couple of different ones. So, for those of uh, those of us who are interested in OMS but want to still continue to serve in the uh, in the Army after you after you graduate, um, your tuition assistance programs inside, at the very least, the Army. I know there are tuition assistance for uh, other DoD branches that are very similar, and the details might vary. But 
Uh, the cost per credit hour for OMS is actually so low uh, that if you were to pursue this on tuition assistance in the Army, you'd actually owe nothing out of pocket uh, for your credit hours. You may have to pay some of the administrative and technical fees, but those are really a drop in the bucket compared to the, uh, compared to the tuition cost per credit hour. Uh, and that's typically not the case. A lot of people who are pursuing uh, graduate education, for example, I have, a, I have a friend who is pursuing a master's in, in business administration. Um, he would essentially uh, have to pay out of pocket the same amount that the military was putting forward through tuition assistance. And uh, that was really you know, kind of a financial burden on him. Uh, and he, he's definitely planning on continuing his service after, uh, after he graduates. For me, on the other hand, uh, I actually was attracted to the program because of its cost, because I was deciding to, uh, to uh, finish my military service and reenter the civilian workforce. So those tuition assistance programs that I mentioned earlier, they carry, a, uh, they carry what's called a service obligation. Um, and typically, it's, uh, it's about two days for every one day you spend in the program. So if you spend two years you know, obtaining your master's degree and you get the Army to pay for it, um, they're going to ask you for four additional years after graduation of, of active duty service time. And, and for those of us who are, who are looking to stay in the military, that's, you know, that's not a problem. It's, it's a career and it's a place that they want to remain. Um, and if you're looking to make a transition, you know, that can be a, a daunting, that, that can be a daunting amount of time, you know, to, to need the financial aid, get the financial aid, but then have to put your, your civilian transition on hold for, for almost half a decade. So one of the things that's very important about the cost of the program is it is something you can't pay for out of pocket with some creative budgeting. And, uh, and it also depends a little bit on your personal situation, but I was actually able to pay for the entire program, uh, out of my own pocket. And, uh, and as a result, I didn't incur any additional duty, uh, additional uh, extension of my, my active duty service obligation. So that meant I was able to prepare for my transition uh, back to the civilian world by taking classes and by, uh, and by graduating with my master's degree. But I also was able to, uh, I was actually also able to leave the Army once that, once that time came. So uh, absolutely, the, the cost of the program, is, it's really it's a win-win, regardless of what your motivations are after you graduate, uh, whether it's continuing service or, or, or transitioning out, you really can't go wrong. So can we talk a little bit about uh, the specific courses and, and elements of the program that have helped propel your career forward after leaving the Army? Um, what did you learn or uh, what skills did you acquire um, through this degree that you're now able to apply to your current research position? Absolutely. Um, so uh, when I when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I actually spent a, you know about a year uh, working in the industry as a as a developer, a uh, pretty traditional job for a CS uh, graduate. And uh, part of the reason uh, I ended up joining the military was uh, I decided that uh, that some of the work that I was doing uh, in in uh, in software development really wasn't uh, where I wanted my career to go. Um, so. Basically discovering that I went off and did something completely different. But when I eventually got to my senses and came back around almost a decade later, um, I started to think about, you know, reentering that workforce and what I wanted to do. So at the very least, I wanted to uh, be able to reenter the workforce and, and, and find a strong footing there. But but secondary to that, I also wanted to explore um, positions that were research focused in computer science where you get to solve more novel problems and you get to spend uh, more time exploring new spaces rather than um, rather than. Uh, essentially, uh, performing development tasks that are well defined and, and, and well documented. So, uh, the work I did uh, in uh, in the GT OMS CS program absolutely was was the reason why I was able to get a job in a research uh, organization upon graduation. Uh, so, the uh, work I did with uh, computer networks and software analysis and testing were uh, were some of the key contributors. Um, I do a lot of software analysis work in the uh, in the position I have now. We do some research projects right now. We're working on some static analysis uh, toolkits for Python code for identifying uh, issues with object models. Uh, and then I also do a lot of cybersecurity research, uh, which is in a similar and in, in kind of a kind of a sister field. And a lot of the um, a lot of the cybersecurity courses that are offered as part of the OMS program really uh, really have made me successful there. So. Uh, it really just depends on, uh, on on where a student wants to take their career. Um, just about anything you take in the program will really help open up a, a novel world uh, in computer science. 
That's great. And we actually have a follow-up question from the audience, Jeffrey. Oh. And I wanted to know approximately how many hours did you put into your studies per week on average? You earned your BS degree in computer science. Um, but if someone doesn't have that, can they succeed in the program? So those are kind of two separate questions for you. Okay, so you know the first part, uh, approximately how many hours did I put into it? Uh, I'd say on average I was between 20 and 40. Keep in mind um, those are during uh, semesters where I was taking two classes uh, at a time, and uh, based on some anecdotal, uh, you know, evidence and some discussions I've had with other students, that seems to be, uh, you know, about the norm. You know, anywhere between 10 and 20 hours per course. Uh, it varied a lot. Uh, it depends on the kind of courses I was taking. Some of them I had a pretty good background in. Um, so the time commitment was obviously a lot lower and some of them I didn't have the background in and the time commitment was much higher. Um, but, but really, uh, really it's going to depend. And, and the fortunate thing about this program is it's, is it's essentially self-paced. Um, the classes themselves have, have, uh, have schedules that generally need to be adhered to, but the pace at which you want to complete the program is really up to you. Um, essentially you have 18 semesters to complete 10 courses to graduate uh, with your degree. So if you need to take breaks, if you need to take time off, if you don't want to take classes in the summer, you can absolutely do that and still have plenty of cushion to complete the, uh, to complete the degree. Um, so this has really enabled people from a wide variety of backgrounds uh, to be successful, kind of you know, getting to our second portion. Um, for those with closely related degrees in computer science, like computer engineering, electrical engineering, uh, information science, et cetera, um, you're going to find that uh, it's pretty, uh, but that there'll be um, a lot of overlap, especially in some of the graduate topics with some of these areas that you might find yourself, uh, find yourself already familiar with. That's one of the good things about pursuing graduate work in computer science is it's not really like uh, undergraduate work. Um, a lot of the undergraduate work you'll do, there are graduate level classes that you can, uh, that you can, uh, you know, for, you know, to, to include a pun here, graduate to and, uh, and take. But um, a lot of the coursework that you'll see in, uh, see in the OMS program are applications of computer science to other fields. For example, embedded computing is a, is a, has a couple of courses, uh, and that's really designed to help bridge the gap between computer science and computer engineering and electrical engineering. So um, if you do not have a degree that's related to computer science, we have people in the program who are very successful uh, in this in this regard as well. Um, what the program doesn't do is provide you an undergraduate degree in computer science along the way. So you'll find that if you're one of these students, you'll have to put a little bit more work into each class to kind of accumulate some of the uh, undergraduate topics that you may have missed out on in your education. But it's by no means impossible. We have people in the program who are, who are literally doing it every day. So um, please don't let uh, your background uh, stop you from applying. That's one of the beautiful things about OMS is that because the admission can be so wide and can be so massive, uh, we don't have to turn students away who don't fit a very, a very narrow profile for success. We can give students an opportunity to succeed even if they don't fit that normal profile. Um, so absolutely, if you don't have an undergraduate degree in computer science, um, whether or not you succeed is, is really up to you. Uh, but you have a chance and you have an opportunity to do so. And that's more than you can say at, at pretty much any other program. Absolutely. Um, so we have another audience question. Blaine is saying, uh, my DOS is in six months and I'm wondering what to expect upon my exit out of the Air Force. What was your experience with job interviews and how did tech companies view you with your MSCS? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I'll be honest, I knew I wanted to work for GTRI when I got out of school because I had had some experience with them uh, in, my, in my time, uh, both as a, as an aviator and, uh, and as a student. So um, GTRI ended up actually being the only place that I applied to, um, but I can speak to that experience a little bit. Um, that particular organization being research focused was uh, very keen on uh, hiring students, or not hiring students, hiring uh, employees that have a master's degree uh, are basically uh, graduate work, um, mainly because a lot of the research projects we work on, they go well beyond uh, the basics that you're going to cover in an undergraduate computer science uh, program. Uh, as far as the interviews when it comes to my military service, um, once again, uh, GTRI is an organization that highly values um, military service 
and people who are able to you know speak DoD. And that's because a lot of the customers that uh, GTRI uh, has contracts with are DoD organizations. So for me, it was actually a really great fit to exit the DoD with a master's degree in computer science and go to an organization that highly values both. Um, as far as what to expect, Blaine, um, for uh, other companies, it really kind of depends on that company's profile. If that company is, uh, you know, does work with the DoD, then they're going to value your military service. If they do work that's very close to some of the work you did while you were serving, then that's definitely something that I, I think would be an asset for you. Um, and as far as the MSCS goes, that really kind of speaks for itself. Everybody's heard of Georgia Tech. Everyone knows it's a top 10 school. So putting, you know, that you have a master's degree in computer science on your on your resume and being able to speak intelligently about advanced topics and computer science, that'll go a long way for you in a job interview. In fact, that's kind of what I banked on uh, when it came time to start looking at looking at opportunities for work. And had I had to expand my horizons beyond GTRI, I really feel that I was going to be well equipped to, you know, to go into technical interviews and be able to uh, be able to accurately represent, you know, my capabilities. Yeah, and, and I can absolutely back that up more generally. Um, I attend conferences throughout the year with OMSCS students um, where there are a lot of these big tech companies uh, recruiting, and these companies want to hire graduates of the program. Uh, I was recently at a conference with an OMSCS student who had one semester to go. She walked up to a, a, an employer chatted for a little bit and received a job offer on the spot. Um, they, these companies uh, are looking for students with the skill set that this program is providing. And, and a lot of people ask, you know, it's an online program. Does it receive the same kind of uh, employer response? And absolutely. We've absolutely seen that consistently for all the students across our program. Um, and just another side thought is um, many, many of our students have utilized connections with other students in the program in their companies and leveraged that to move into uh, a role. So I would say spend some time chatting with the other students and see what is available because we've had a number of students help uh, boost uh, fellow students into jobs with their own companies. Um, I would highly, highly encourage that. So we have actually someone wanting to come up on stage and ask a oh. question from Jermaine. So let's bring Jermaine up on stage. And good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Hey, Jermaine. I'm good, Jermaine. How are you? Hey, great. One of the questions were actually answered. Um, the first question I had was, um, in the Atlanta area, um, do they look at the online degree with as much prestige as they do with the actual um, traditional master's degree. I think that was kind of answered, but I just want to know what your experience was when you put that on paper. And do they do they ask more questions? Are they kind of skeptical about it, or how does that go for you? Well, uh, one thing that's important to bring up is that there is absolutely no distinction between the online version of the master's of science and computer science and the and the residential version. You take the exact same classes, the classes that are offered in the residential version are the same as the ones that are offered online. In fact, they did a little bit of a kind of a micro study where they took a look at courses that were offered both online and, and on campus. And they found that there is no significant uh, deviation on some cases in some semesters, the online students did a little bit better. And in some uh, semesters and in some cases, some courses, the, uh, the on-campus students did a little bit better on, on average with the same set of assignments. Um, so one thing that you can always mention is that the quality of education at its core, that's what really ultimately matters, is definitely definitely the same. Additionally, the degree document that you'll receive makes no mention of the coursework being online. The delivery method is completely uh, absent on your, uh, on your ultimate uh, deliverable from the program. So when you walk away uh, from the stage in McCamish Pavilion with, with your degree in hand, it doesn't say online on it, which is another thing that you can uh, take with you when you start building your resume. There's no reason to really even put online on there because the quality of education isn't different. Georgia Tech is, is an on-campus and an online institution now. Um, and honestly, even if you did have to put, uh, or even if it didn't come up that your, your degree was online, uh, at least in my interviews, uh, it definitely didn't come up. Uh, granted, that was probably because I was applying for an organization within Georgia Tech. Um, but from the other students that I've talked to uh, who've graduated and gone on to, to start looking for new jobs, those who've gotten jobs at uh, tech giants like Google and Facebook, 
uh, there was absolutely no question um, about the online component. Uh, the online component is completely dwarfed by the fact that your degree comes from Georgia Tech. So uh, I don't think you have anything to worry about there. Not a problem. And may I ask one more question? What were the um, the entrance requirements, um, GMAT, et cetera? And how did you take care of that while you were in if there was an actual requirement? Well, it's actually uh, funny you bring that up. You don't have to take the GRE to apply for uh, OMSCS. Uh, so when it comes to one of the one of the hurdles for most graduate students that requires you to be in a specific place at a specific time, which frankly is a lot easier said than done for a lot of service members, uh, you actually don't have to take that uh, take that test. Um, as far as the entrance requirements, uh, mainly they are uh, uh, providing transcripts and paperwork, personal essay, uh, as well as uh, as well as letters of recommendation. So uh, letters of recommendation from academics are typically preferred for graduate applications, and that kind of can be a bit of a can bit of be a bit of a sticking point for for some of us, especially uh, military service members who may be like myself, very far removed from their time and. and at an academic institution. So uh, that being said, I got all of my letters of recommendation from previous commanders and people I'd worked with. And a lot of other students who apply to this program are in the same boat. So that, that typical expectation that people have, you know, I need to find professors or I need to find, you know, a dean or I need to find somebody in, in academia uh, who's got a long publishing history to write me a recommendation or I won't get in. It really doesn't apply to, to OMS because the acceptance uh, net is really so wide that we don't have to look for students who have that traditional profile where you know they've already done some graduate work or they were attached to the hip to a professor in their undergrad and, and they got a great letter of recommendation out of it. Really, all you need are, are three people who can speak to your intelligence, your capability to uh, to work in the field of computer science. And if you can if you can get three of those together, uh, I'd say your chances of getting in our uh, on the application process are, are pretty much a lot. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, great. And keep the questions coming. We we love to hear that from the audience. Um, so just continuing on with, with what we were talking about, um, let's talk about your daily life now, uh, your work now, and, and how did you feel prepared uh, going into your current role? Was there an adjustment period? after leaving um, and finishing your service, what was that experience like for you? Well, it's definitely, uh, it definitely an experience to transition out of the military. There's a lot of things that you get kind of conditioned to after a while. Um, and as far as my day-to-day -day life goes, I don't have to get up at 5.30 in the morning to go run around the airfield. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, as much as I loved running around the airfield, I really didn't feel the need to do it Monday through Friday and, and get up that early to do it. Now I can get up when I feel like, uh, <laughs> when I feel like it. Um, so there, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of parts of my life that are, um, you know, definitely a lot more, uh, a lot more relaxing and a lot more laid back. Um, so I definitely enjoy that part of it. Um, it was definitely a challenge, uh, leaving, you know, the military apparatus and, and, and going into a new, Going into a new job and, and really the, the the time I spent in industry before I joined the army really didn't prepare me for for a research role. But one of the things that put me at ease is is that three or four of the people I work with are actually in the program and had taken a class that I had TA'd for. So I actually ended up being able to use that OMS community to make it kind of some some insta friends at work. So uh, when when you spoke earlier about uh, talking to some of the people in the community uh, of OMS folks and when you're looking to either you know it's perhaps change jobs or maybe move to a different role within your organization. Uh, definitely seek out other people who have been, who have an OMS story because just, I don't think I've met a single person who has a negative experience with OMS. And, and that means you have, you have people out there everywhere who are kind of, you know, only, a only, a you know, a step or two away from, you know, having a lot in common with you, you know, the same struggles that you have trying to pursue your graduate degree and, and the same, you know, the same struggles you have uh, at work. As far as being prepared, uh, like I had mentioned, a lot of the work that I do at GTRI is very um, is very much about uh, advanced topics in computer science. It's research focused. So the work I did in in, in OMS absolutely prepared me for it um, a lot better than I thought it would actually. Um, so for those who have you know work that's a little bit more programming focused or a little bit more QA focused or maybe IT focused, you may find that the benefits uh, aren't quite as much as they were for me. It's kind of a unique case, you know, uh, going from uh, from a graduate degree to a research oriented position. But if that's a transition you want to make, then you're absolutely going to find that it prepares you very well. 
And typically those of us who are uh, already established in our career fields looking to make a change, the master's degree absolutely helps them perform at a higher level. And, and definitely for those who come from a different background set, who, who kind of are, are looking at this program as a way of, of jumping into a new career, uh, the people I've talked to so far have, have had a lot of great success with that. Um, mainly because the, well, when you obtain a, a master's in computer science, it, it absolutely communicates that you have uh, at least um, explored and, and mastered the undergraduate uh, material as well. So um, it basically, it's going to make the conversation with your prospective employer about, you know, them potentially being worried that you don't have an undergraduate degree in computer science. That kind of goes away when you can put the put the master's degree uh, on your on your education section of your resume. So really, I don't think I've found a single person who's had uh, who's had trouble fitting in or, or doing well at work uh, who's obtained a who's, who's finished the degree program. So we're kind of coming in to the close of this. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. So keep the questions coming. Um, they've been great. Um, I guess kind of in conclusion, uh, if, if I were to have a conversation with uh, someone who is serving currently or a veteran and they express the interest in, uh, in accomplishing what you've accomplished and kind of following that path and, and, and completing the program and um, transitioning into a new role after the program, how would you, what steps would you suggest that they take to, to kind of start along that path? Well, uh, the hardest part of this program is, is actually applying in the first place. There are a lot of people who, who question whether or not they should or shouldn't apply as if, uh, as if asking the admission staff to to review their their admission would somehow be putting them out. It's it, it's you know I'd encourage people to remember that that's the, that's their job. So um, and they absolutely love the fact that they can admit way more students than just about any other admission staff on on, on Georgia Tech or other campuses. So um, if you want to start taking the first steps, uh, evaluate where your background is relative to the preferred uh, the preferred uh, prerequisites that the program specifies, and that's a uh, it's a bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, typically, they're looking for you know a, a good GPA, but um, a lot of those things kind of go away when you can uh, talk about uh, highly relevant work experience. So, if uh, another thing I'll mention is if you aren't accepted on your first round of admissions, absolutely reapply. You, you have absolutely nothing to lose. Um, so, if you uh, if you do that inventory, you kind of understand where you are relative to to what the, uh, what the Institute's looking for. It gives you an opportunity to start identifying some of your weaknesses and finding areas where you can, uh, where you can kind of shore up your application. Um, so assuming that we, we kind of move beyond that to the point where you're ready to start the program after, after, after being admitted, um, absolutely the, the, the most important thing you can do to ensure your success is get the support of your family and get the support of, uh, of, of your loved ones around you. Um, if they aren't supportive of you spending the time necessary to do uh, this program, uh, or um, you aren't accurately representing what that commitment's going to look like, um, it, you know that can that can be a source of discord along the way. I can't express enough how how the support of my wife really helped me succeed in this program. There were a lot of evenings that I had to go upstairs to the office and you know work on things that looked like absolute Greek to her, but um, she understood what uh, you know what I was doing and, and what it meant for us. And I think if you can clearly communicate that to the people around you, then then you absolutely um, can be successful. And then third and, and, and finally, before you start taking classes, uh, integrate yourself into the community. There's a great Google Plus community for uh, OMS students, both prospective established students and students who've graduated. Uh, we have a study Slack channel for those of you admitted to the program where you can start talking with other students who are actively in the program uh, who can help give you advice about what classes to take, um, about the kind of uh, the kind of course details and course scheduling that might make you successful one semester versus another. For example, if you have a long vacation or you have a you know a long work trip coming up, that you'll you'll need a you'll need a course that doesn't have a conflict. Um, so there's a lot of really great information that you can get there that goes way beyond uh, what the program can put on their on their web page. There's a lot of great information on there, but they can't possibly get everything. And you have so many human beings who are very dedicated to this program we're more than happy to help you with any questions you might have so uh you know i'll close on that ask as many questions as you can once you get to the point where you're registered for a class and you're taking it everything's easy you'll have a syllabus you'll know exactly what you need to do and then from there it's just 
it's just absorbing everything and then learning everything and exploring, you know, some of these really interesting worlds that you're about to dive into. Um, so, you know, don't get hung up on what you're going to do in the class, in the classroom. You've, you've got a staff for that. You've got an instructor who's going to help you learn that material. You've got a bunch of great things that are set up. Worry about all the things that, that, that lead up to it. Um, don't let yourself, you know, talk yourself out of applying. And when you do get in and you do get ready to start this program, put yourself in a position where you've, where you've got the support of your, uh, your family and people in the community and, and you'll be successful. Absolutely. And we actually have a follow-up question to that from Jeffrey, uh, right. who's interested in the program. Um, he is asking artificial intelligence and machine learning are the twin pillars of the next area, which employers are seeking. Does OMSCS offer either or both areas within the program? So I can go ahead and say yes to that, but I think Michael, you could, <laughs> maybe elaborate a little bit on some of those types of courses in that area that were most impactful that you were able to, to take and participate in. Well, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are very important uh, topics in computer science that are being applied to uh, a lot of fields now that they have become uh, much more mature over the past you know, 10 or so years. Um, so, the OMS program does offer uh, both courses specifically in artificial intelligence uh, and in machine learning. In fact, there's actually many flavors of both. I think there's, I think six or seven courses on the, uh, on the roster that, that fall under the, uh, I fall under artificial intelligence or under machine learning. In fact, you can also specialize in it uh, as well. Um, so I actually did not take any of these courses while I was in there, but they all come very, very highly uh, recommended and very, very well reviewed uh, among my peers. So uh, we have, in fact, uh, one of the deans in the College of Computing, uh, Dean Isbell, teaches the course in, uh, in machine learning. And it is consistently one of the most positive experiences I hear people talk about when they talk about the program for those who have taken it. So if you'll allow me to inject a bit of hearsay, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and plug that one for and plug that course for, for anybody looking to take, uh, take those kind of courses. Um, so there, there's a lot of really good opportunities when it comes to some of the underpinnings of uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, like data science. There are undergraduate, they're not undergrad, sorry. There are other courses that, that address some of those underpinnings, uh, classes like data and visual analytics um, uh, that come to mind. So there's a lot of really good opportunities to explore that space within this program. There's a lot of really amazing faculty. Um, very well published and you know very well versed faculty in this in this area that uh, that were among some of the first to actually put their courses in the online format. Absolutely, um, and now we have a, a video question from Dante. So we're going to go ahead and bring Dante up so he can ask his question. Hey, Michael. Hi. Hey, Brittany. Hi. Hey, Dante. Good to see hey. you again. How are you? Good. Great. It's so good to see you. And um, thanks, Brittany, for a great series. Michael, thanks for making Computer Networks such a great class as head TA and um, thanks for your service and thanks for anyone in military that's online now for your service. Uh, just had a quick question, Michael. Um, what if you can discuss any aspect of your research interests? Uh, what is it specifically? And um, are you going to be attending conferences this year? Well, I'm looking at trying to attend PLDI in uh, 2018. Um, so uh, looking to work that out, something uh, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to work out uh, sponsor trips to some of these uh, some of these events with uh, with my organization. We actually, believe it or not, have a rather limited budget for an entire lab's worth of people to send people out for conferences. So I have to see if it's a if it's an off year. Um, but specifically right now, a lot of my research interests lie in the area um, of applying software analysis techniques that have really matured over the last 20 years uh, into fields that have had a distinct lack of uh, that kind of analysis. So uh, one of these particular examples is in the realm of uh, computer networks. So it actually kind of marries up a couple of my, couple of my favorite courses in OMS. Um, so specifically looking at ways to perform static analysis on a network stack, uh, on an application, um, in particular, one of the biggest issues with performing uh, static analysis on code that uses networks is that you essentially have to stop your analysis uh, at the point where you send packets across the wire. So I'm interested in looking at techniques to flatten the, uh, the endpoints of that network so that you can perform static analysis across those boundaries, as well as perform other forms of dynamic analysis on computer networks, like, um, for example, doing fuzz testing uh, across, uh, across network ports. 
So unfortunately, I'm getting a chance to work on some of those on an internal basis at GTRI, um, as well as uh, hopefully I'll be able to explore those topics as a PhD student next year. Excellent. Well, congrats on all the accomplishments. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great to see you again. Good seeing you, Michael. Fantastic. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, so I'm just going to say uh, for anyone who has uh, follow up questions or thoughts that they'd like to share, please feel free to reach out to me and email me. Um, my email is B A I E L L O at cc.gatech.edu, B-I-L-O at cc.gatech.edu. And I will uh, reach out to Michael um, and, and make any connections uh, necessary uh, or follow up with him with questions uh, from the audience. Happy to do that. Also, I would love to thank the Shindig team. Uh, this has been a great semester of seminars and Tara from Shindig, and then also Matt Lyle from uh, Georgia Tech Center for 21st Century Universities. Uh, those two have, have been pivotal in helping us get this seminar series off the ground, and so we're, we're grateful for that. And Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences. Um, I hope it's been meaningful for everyone who has attended. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about Michael's experiences, we actually on the OMSCS website, he is the uh, header image right now, uh, a story about about his his time as a student in the program um, and, and some resources, some video interviews with him as well. Uh, this is recorded, so I'll be uh, adding this link to our YouTube channel, the College of Computing's YouTube channel, if you want to watch or share with anyone. Um, and again, thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to participate. And, and Michael, it was great talking to you. Um, and we will see you in the new year. We're, this is our last one of the semester, so we'll start back up with the seminar series in January. So happy holidays to everyone. Good night. Bye.